further ado, Charles and Autumn, it is over to you. All right, thank you everybody for coming today. We're so excited to have you. Um, and um, Autumn, if you want to share your screen, we can um, kick off this workshop. Are you seeing the presentation now? I am. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we are here to talk about creating counter media text in the open with Annotate Ed Tech. Uh, my name is Charles Logan. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm a PhD student in the Learning Sciences program at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, which is just north of Chicago. And I'm very excited to be joined by Autumn. Hi, everybody. My name is Autumn Keynes. I go by um, pronouns of she, her, hers. Um, and I'm an instructional designer at the University of Michigan Dearborn. And you can reach out to me on Twitter at handle uh, at Autumn with two M's, A-U-T-U-M-M. -M. Um, we did want to begin with uh, land acknowledgments. Um, I am an uninvited visitor on the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Odawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. These homelands were a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes and are still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. I also want to acknowledge that in addition to land being taken and erased from indigenous peoples, part of the um, uh, settler colonials project is also erasing indigenous uh, knowledge and ways of knowing. Um, and we heard a little bit about this last week in keynotes. Um, and so I, I was actually reading this paper um, from Dr. Megan Bang, a native uh, scholar at Northwestern that I'm very lucky and grateful to be learning with in the Learning Sciences program. And I wanted to share um, her work and this paper in particular because um, for me, it resonated a lot with what um, some of the conversations um, were happening last week around um, thinking about um, epistemic violence, thinking about ways in which closure may actually um, be preferable to openness. Um, and so um, to me, uh, it's important to uh, share this work um, because I continue to learn from it. Um, and so I wanted to share it with everybody today. Uh, my institution does not have a statement, so I do not have a statement that was developed in conjunction with Native peoples acknowledging the land. Um, and so I'm very sensitive to that. Um, but I am aware that I live and work on the territory of the Three Fires Confederacy of First Nations comprised of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. And I acknowledge that the land that we now call the United States was taken in unconscionable ways from indigenous peoples. I'm interested in these histories and I'm seeking teachers and resources. Um, and to come to this uh, land acknowledgement um, that I wrote myself because my institution doesn't have one. I've listed some resources there at the bottom and we will make the links available um, after the fact. All right, so what are we gonna do today? Um, we are gonna get to the annotation and the discussion, which is gonna be the heart of our session today. Before we do that though, um, we thought it was important to provide a little bit of history and context um, before we could sort of dive into the margins and get annotating. So next slide. Um, I made this meme uh, because I think it helps to uh, uh, illustrate the genesis of Annotate EdTech. So over the course of the past year and a half, two years, I have been, as, long, as well as many others, um, frustrated by some of the rhetoric that um, online proctoring CEOs and companies use to sell their products, um, which in my opinion are racist, ableist, pri privacy invading surveillance tech. And yet a lot of the CEOs, um, both on their websites as well as um, letters to um, senators here in the United States, um, uh, sort of praise their, their surveillance um, with language of equity and integrity. And so um, to me, that was troubling. And so um, I wanted to sort of push back against that language and push back against those narratives in a critical fashion. Um, and so um, Annotate EdTech was sort of born out of that uh, frustration. 
Um, real quickly, uh, so I had this idea of what if we use um, social annotation to construct some counter narratives. And so I went to um, Autumn and Nathan Schneider and Aaron Glass, all of whom um, are part of a group called Ethical EdTech. And I said, hey, what if we did this thing? And they said, hey, that sounds cool. <laughs> um, and so they were very supportive. Um, and then last November, a bunch of folks from across the world actually um, gathered. Um, we use Zoom um, as well as um, a Rise Up Etherpad. And Etherpads are open software um, collaborative writing um, documents um, in conjunction with Hypothesis, the social annotation tool that we're going to use today. Um, and we were able to create 95 annotations and responses, conversations on the websites of three of the major um, online proctoring or in invigilation or invigilation, um, as I think it's known um, outside of the, of the United States. Um, as a means of producing what um, Rami Kalir and Antero Garcia describe as a counter narrative or an alternative to conventional methods and messages. So in my mind, um, annotate ed tech is sort of this movable feast. It's this thing that um, uh, sort of a learning experience um, aimed at, for me, um, sort of bringing that degree of criticality towards narratives that are um, sold by ed tech companies, and then often taken up uh, by institutions, and then, of course, um, uh, used, I would argue, against um, students. Um, and so we're going to be thinking about creating a counter narrative together today. And Autumn, I think this is this. Uh, I thought I was the next one. one. OK. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> this is hypothesis. Uh, this is what it looks like. So I will say, um, uh, as a reminder, we are using hypothesis. You will need a hypothesis account if you would like to annotate today. You do not need to annotate to participate. You can still read the annotations, um, and that's totally fine. Um, and I do want to recognize that one of the companies that we are um, going to be annotating some of their um, language uh, is extraordinarily litigious um, as well as um, uh, problematic. So I um, totally understand um, if folks would rather sort of watch the annotation and then join the conversation or not um, be in the chat. Whatever sort of engagement looks like for you today, fantastic. Um, but this is um, the interface for Hypothesis on the right-hand side. And so what you see here is that that production of that um, counter narrative. Here are three different examples of this is taken from the Proctor U um, created a student bill of rights. And so um, we don't know if any students were involved in the creation of this document or teachers or if it was just sort of um, company folks. Um, and so we see here um, in the first annotation it's this close reading asking questions about the kind of underlying assumptions and language. Um, used by the ed tech company, and then working together to expand that knowledge. And to me, that's a really powerful way of thinking about annotation is, again, creating those counter narratives um, in community. And so that, to me, um, is one of the really powerful ways of using social annotation. And just in the spirit of um making this part the participation that we're inviting you to be a part of um, today, making it your own is that it doesn't have to just be um, for today. So uh, I'll draw your attention. Again, these are screenshots from the last annotated tech that um, was run. And you'll notice that um, the one on the left from Valerie, November 16th, was done on the actual day of the event. And the next one from uh, CogDog, uh, is um, November 17th. So don't feel like you also have to stop annotating af you know, um, after this event is over. If you want to go back and continue to read, or if you want to pass the annotation link on to others, um, feel free to do that. You can uh, really kind of make this your own. It doesn't have to be just tied to this particular event. You can also stretch this out over time as well. And one other thing, actually, on, would you mind going back to the previous slide? I just want to point yeah. to, I think, another powerful um, um, way of, of learning that these two annotations point out is using the affordances of the, of the open web. And so you have here um, the, a sort of collection of hyperlinks of resources. And so to me, that's another powerful element um, of annotate ed tech is both the careful reading of the text that's on the screen, 
but the way in which that text is in conversation with others. And so using hyperlinks, using, as we'll see on the next slide, um, images as a way to create a really kind of rich and robust um, uh, set of, of uh, resources. And so here we have a sticker that was actually placed um, on the, uh, one of the company websites by the Prophet of Innovation Doom. Uh, is the person's username. Um, and this sticker actually comes from something that um, Chris Gilliard, a, a professor and um, tech critic, um, has said. And um, and actually, I think, uh, I don't know if Autumn has more of these stickers, but <laughs> I know she and Chris were uh, mailing them out um, to folks who requested. Um, and then on the right is actually a GIF. Um, so you can use GIFs in Hypothesis. Um, again, thinking about that word integrity um, and really um, reading closely and uh, uh, the language that these companies use to sell their, their products um, and sort of poking fun in this case, um, using humor as a means of sort of um, surfacing some, some problematic um, uses of the language, uh, certainly in this, in this person's opinion. Um, so I want to point those out. Um, and both of these um, images and then the individual annotations as well as the conversation get at, I think, a key idea that um, I want to point out in the next slide. And that is this, that um, annotation um, carries with it political um, and social um, um, aspects to it. And so this is a quote from Remy Clear, who's done a lot of work in social annotation. And then I just want to draw um, your, everybody's attention to um, a distinction that he makes between defacing something, um, which um, he uh, argues uh, centers the ide ideology of white supremacy, versus using um, sort of the language around graffiti. Um, and that graffiti, as he argues, um, and I would agree, um, is more of these intentional marks of justice directed counter narratives. And here he shares an example um, of a statue of the Confederate General Robert E. Lee um, in Richmond, Virginia. And this um, uh, place has become a kind of um, gathering point for Black Lives Matter protesters here in the US. Um, and so, um, yeah, absolutely, Maha. And I, and I think um, sort of in that spirit of criticality, but also of, of creating justice-oriented um, graffiti, that's what we're going to be thinking about today um, as we move into um, our, our annotation portion and thinking about partnerships between ed tech companies that have um, a very kind of specific way of thinking about um, teaching and learning teachers and students. Um, and so we're going to um, provide a little bit more context now about um, the companies that um, we're going to be uh, engaging with today. So uh, the article that we are going to uh, annotate is a press release about a Top Hat partnering with Proctorio um, to deliver free, secure online proctored tests and exams remotely. Uh, we'll be getting, getting you a link to the article that will enable the hypothesis um annotation here in just a second unless somebody's already done that i should say too i can't see the chat right now the only thing i can see is the uh and i hear the little bings coming in so i know that folks are chatting but um yeah i can't see the chat right now just fyi on that and we just wanted Autumn, to I just, I just um, put the link sorry i didn't interrupt i just put the link to the hypothesis enabled um uh right. press release so yes please do tweet tweet away <laughs> Yeah, and if you want to share that out, you absolutely can. We would love to invite more people to come in and annotate with us. But before we got started on this, um, I want to recognize that not everybody knows what remote proctoring is. We are talking to a global audience, and some people don't even call it proctoring. Like uh, Charles just said, they call it invigilation. And so I um, want to talk a little bit about the harms of remote proctoring. Um, and so uh, we're talking about proctorio when we talk about the proctoring piece of this. This is kind of a little bit of a complicated piece because we're basically talking about a partnership that's being um, created between two companies. One of the companies is proctorio and they do remote proctoring and there are problems with remote proctoring on a number of different uh, levels. 
uh, we have lots of examples of this technology in particular being racist and ableist. Um, it is a 100% uh, algorithmic proctoring. There is no humans involved in this case, and it's not to say that human proctoring in a remote setting is okay or good. That has a whole other set of problems as well. Um, but we see people with darker faces who cannot be picked up by the algorithm, um, which, uh, you know, puts them in a situation where their things are much different and they get disenfranchised in um, really problematic ways. Um, the proctoring companies will tell you, oh, they can just call the helpline and they'll let them in or they'll help them troubleshoot it. But we have um, just some really dehumanizing factors. People asking, people being asked to shine the lights on their face with flashlights and um, just can be really problematic. Uh, it, there's many, many examples of uh, this technology not working. The companies, of course, will tell you that, oh, it's 100 percent every time you can completely control your exams and your tests. But um, there's there's many, many examples of students finding ways around. Um, humans are very inventive. <laughs> so it is not it is not 100 percent. There are many examples of it not working. Uh, it's very expensive. There are lots of cost concerns, um, uh, data security concerns. There are many, uh, not with this, uh, well, I, I can't say with this particular company, but with many of these remote proctoring companies, there are several instances of data breaches, um, that kind of thing. So what's happening with these data and um, uh, how well are they being secured? Uh, privacy concerns. So just the fact that students are asked to put themselves on camera, they have no choice. They have to do a room scan. So they're uh, and we're not talking about like a shared testing environment, right? We're talking about people's bedrooms, people's living rooms, shared um, spaces, that kind of thing. And then. Um, just what this does to the normalization of, of sur a surveillance culture that we're talking about a school environment where students are um, learning about the world around them and about what kind of people they are going to be in society and when this is made normal in a school environment. Um, this uh, is easily becomes something that can perpetuate out into other parts of society. Um, and so, like I said, what the, the article is about is an, it's an announcement. It's a, it's a press release of a, what, um, uh, something that uh, I call a fourth party integration. That is a thing that is out there, a fourth party vendor. And what this is, that as an institution, you make a partnership with Top Hat, let's say. But then all of a sudden, Top Hat announces that there's a new feature that they have. And if you go to Top Hat's website, you don't look at this press release, but if you just go to their website and click on the page about their remote proctoring, you would have no idea that the remote proctoring is from, uh, from Proctorio. There's no mention of Proctorio on that site. Um, there's screenshots of the tool, and if you're familiar with Proctorio, you might be able to see and recognize that the Proctorio is the tool. But um, yeah, you would have no idea. You, uh, as an institution, would not have signed an agreement with Proctorio. You wouldn't. Um, necessarily like have any idea that this is going on. This also is a huge loophole. So there's a lot of institutions that are trying to set some limits on the number of vendors that they're interfacing with because this opens up all kinds of problems for data security and that kind of thing. Um, so this is a huge loophole to that. Now all of a sudden your students, you and your students' data are going to be um, interfacing with being collected by, stored by Proctorio, and you really had no idea. You signed up for Top Hat. Um, and this begs the question, well, what is Top Hat? Top Hat, uh, uh, lends, it, they call themselves an active learning platform, and they do a bunch of different things. So they have a textbook, so you can buy your textbooks through them. Um, they have an annotation tool, so we're going to be using Hypothesis today, but like Top Hat has their own annotation tool. They do remote proctoring by reselling Proctorio even though that's not entirely uh, clear at the front end. They also have a clicker 
um, kind of like a response system type of tool, and they provide uh, some learning analytics as well. So just to give you a little bit of an idea of the um, the uh, tool that we're going to be, or I'm sorry, the article that we're going to be annotating, that's kind of the different players that are involved, and the, the article itself is a, uh, it's a press release about a partnership between the two. Okay, let's get annotating. <laughs> so, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, you do need an hypothesis account um, in order to annotate. You will not need one if you just want to um, observe and see the annotations. Um, I think Autumn is going to demonstrate what that looks like here in a second. Um, I did put that link in the um, chat um, as well as Autumn. I'll let you know that I put the um, against online proctoring um, uh, open library that um, we have been Lovely. and other folks have been helping to curate. Autumn also has a really wonderful, um, if you follow her on Twitter, which you should definitely do, uh, a kind of um, ongoing um, uh, lit review in which she sort of calls out um, and shares different articles. Um, there is a depressingly large <laughs> number of them. Um, and so um, what as we move into annotation, what we're going to do is we'll just um, turn off our, our, I mean, everyone's camera, I think is off right now and audio, but um, we'll just have some quiet annotation time. Um, uh, I'll be in the chat if, if people have questions. Um, if at any point you do want to just sort of ask a question, please do that in the chat. You can turn your camera on and your mic on. Um, so uh, we'll be able to have some annotation time. Um, as we annotate, you might be considering some of the questions that we've listed here. I'm really, as I said, overall, the aim of thinking about, you know, what is the narrative that these companies are telling and selling about their products? Um, and um, where might we produce a counter narrative? Um, um, and so that's sort of the goal for our annotation um, time. And then we're going to have a little bit of time at the end, maybe 10 minutes or so, to sort of debrief, um, um, share any noticings, um, and think about um, broadly um, where annotate EdTech might fit into your teaching and learning practices and contexts. So I think that's that part, Autumn, if you want to. Um, oh, yeah, that's a good question. We use the annotate EdTech, and it is important for um, accessibility reasons um, to capitalize the E in ed and the T in tech. So if you are going to um, use the hashtag, please um, make sure you do that. Um, that's a great question, Maha. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think we're probably ready for the um, demoing. Are you able to see the article now? Yeah. OK. And so, um, yeah, when you first come to the uh, uh, the text that we're going to be annotating, um, you will see the article. You may want to take a moment to kind of read through it and uh, see what's going on with it um, and think about your annotations. And then basically there should be a little sidebar over here. You'll notice that there's a little arrow and an eye and a little page. And I usually just start with the arrow to open up the sidebar. You'll notice that there's page notes here. So Charles has started us off with an initial page note with those um, uh, questions that you might want to think about while you're annotating. And then the um, individual annotations uh, will be over here on the side. To make an annotation, it's pretty simple. You can um, just highlight. And then um, you want to go to annotate, not highlight. Your highlights are private to you. Your annotations will be public um, to anybody who's on this article with the hypothesis uh, link or with the hypothesis plugin. And then when I click on annotate, say, And when I'm ready, post to public. You'll notice that if anybody wants to respond to that question, you can come over here to uh, reply and make a reply there. And it looks like we've already got some new annotations coming in. I can tell because there's a red 
circle with a download kind of arrow here. And then when I click on that, I'll get my new annotations will pop in. And I see Mehabeli and Carolyn are in here already jumping into some stuff. So now I'll be quiet. Uh, Charles, if you have anything else you'd like to add um, and just let people annotate. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is that if you do, and I see some folks doing it, I um, want to add um, the annotate edtech tag or the, and even the OER yes, by domains you. 21 tag too. And the reason why mm -hmm. that is potentially helpful is that once you click that tag, um, you'll be in conversation not only obviously with what we're doing today, but um, you'll also be able to call up annotations from any other annotation that has been tagged. So that's the usefulness of, of the tag there. Um, yeah, and so let's see, it's about 10.30 a.m. my time here in, in the central uh, time zone um, in the U.S. So why don't we spend maybe about 15 minutes on them or so? Um, and we'll good. see. I mean, if there's, a, if there's a lot of energy in the margins, then we can take it longer. But yeah, our goal is really just to have that, that quiet work time now. If you have questions, please do unmute yourself and ask or use the chat. Um, and otherwise, uh, happy annotating, happy counter narrative writing. And we'll um, debrief here in about 15 minutes or so.
it will annotate for about another three minutes and then come back and sort of debrief on the experience. Lots of really wonderful conversations happening. Really good. Okay, I've got 1048 my time, and so I want to make sure that we have enough time to just sort of debrief. Um, and I'm curious, um, as folks um, looked at um, the article and the annotations, um, what struck you? Was there anything in particular that you were surprised, that made you <laughs> angry, frustrated? Um, what, what kind of, um, yeah struck you about about the the narrative at, uh, uh, that emerged about education and teaching and learning from from this and, and any of the comments that you read or, or left and you can respond in the chat if you want to unmute yourself that's fine too oh Matt is back Welcome back, Maha. We were just saying we're just going to open it up for um, conversation about what we just did, about what we just saw. And you can feel free to jump in. It looks like Carolyn has her hand raised. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. And I was just going to pipe in and respond to Logan's question. I think something that was um, significant to me was the peppering of you know, potentially positive terms or terms that are attractive to engage educators, the peppering of words like active learning, integrity, and like pedagogical approach. It's just kind of this peppering of these words that are kind of in some ways being co-opted in the actual overall message to me being expressed in the, in the press release. So I think that was something that you know, so often I found myself pausing and being like, how are they defining that? I don't think it's the same way that I might necessarily define that term. Yeah, that's a great point. Were there, were there other words um, or phrases that anyone else noticed as sort of um, 
yeah, um, kind of language that, um, yeah, integrity of exams, yeah, and that students. Yeah, that point Maha makes me think about some of Autumn's work that she's done around um, weaponization of care, and that it's not caring um, uh, uh, for students, but about students. Yeah. yeah, and I'm expanding that article actually into a more full length article. So I've been I'm actually in the middle of drafting it. So it's very, very at the forefront of my mind. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's a yes. I uh, attended your workshop on, uh, you know, the, the um, I believe you were citing Jane Toronto and I, I usually go through uh, Nell Nodding's. But this idea of there's a difference between caring for and caring about and uh caring about ideas and um things is much different than caring for people and so we see this division of caring about integrity comparing about c caring about um rigor caring about these ideas but um what about caring for students and the vulnerable students who could potentially be harmed in these spaces right Other noticings about either the um, language from the press release or any of the um, conversation that was happening in the annotation? I mean, one of the things that I'm really sensitive to is, uh, you know, this this partnership that this is just. Uh, you know, pass up as like, oh, there's a new feature. We have, we we now can offer you this thing, um, and and thinking about what about the people who don't want that? You know, what about the uh, top hat customers who signed who didn't sign up for that? And now all of a sudden there's this free thing uh, that is available to them. I will say I do believe that they only offered it free for a certain amount of time. And we saw this specifically around the time of the pandemic, right? All of these, the beginning of the pandemic, I should say, because we're still in the pandemic, but we saw a lot of companies come out, um, with this, oh, we want to care for you language. Oh, we want, oh, and we're going to give you something for free, right? <laughs> so, um, I do think they rolled that back a bit and that now you have to students actually have to pay specifically for like the tests that they're going to be offered. Um, so it's not an improvement, <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, it just strikes me about how these partnerships can impact us, especially if you're like an administrator at an institution. You didn't sign up for this. You didn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, vet this product. You didn't have a committee that looked at this product and figured out if it was the right thing for your institution and the right thing for your students. And now all of a sudden, guess what? You're you're now a proctorial customer, just like that. Um, and that just seems really problematic to me. I'm also thinking about language around seamless, efficient, I think, I don't know if efficiency is in there, but I think so much of it, um, you know, selling, selling, right? On the one hand, I understand you want your technology to work, <laughs> but also this notion of, I think it, it sort of bleeds into teaching and learning as seamless, as, you know, uh, smooth and, and what happens when um, that kind of vision of education is one that, is widely adopted um, rather than, uh, you know, education as learning as challenging, as, um, you know, rough in places and, and rather than trying to smooth away all of the difficulties, um, you know, where might um, those challenges really be embraced rather than um, everything happening seamlessly. That being said, you do want your, your <laughs> technology to work like today, right? Um, so that that's interesting that that tension I suppose. I love uh, this little back and forth between Meha and Sinkinson and here with the um, uh, no choice to refuse. That makes me think about the against surveillance uh, event that happened last year, and I believe it was in Meha's session with. Uh, 
Benjamin Daxter and Sava Sahlazing and Chris Gillier. That was one of the, when they talked about care in some of these spaces that when you are, you know, presented with this caring language, if you're presented with some of these uh, welcoming uh, statements, you know, ask yourself, well, what does it mean for me to refuse if I were to say no to this gift that you're offering me? Am I am I even able to refuse it? And and that's that is what I believe is a key. That's a key indicator for anybody who's trying to figure out is this real care or is this a weaponization of care? If you can't refuse it, if you can't say no, it's it, there ain't something right. There's something not right about that. <laughs> that is true as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm saying here. Yeah. I mean, I'm right there, but yeah, the um the institutions definitely have a lot um a lot of influence here. Uh and it's bigger than just any one technology tool. We're not picking on any one technology tool here. Um or even a set of technologies because this is uh systemic um, problem that we have in the idea that we think about uh, um, the assessments that we give. It's in our accrediting agencies. It's in our institutions. It, it's a lot bigger than just uh, trying to talk about problematic technologies. Yeah, it's been interesting to see it, just reading the comment about, you know, as the rise of these technologies, and again, I, I want to echo what Autumn said, it's not one particular type of technology, but it seems like in conjunction with that conversation of assessment, um, as these technologies have, have risen, sort of exposed um, uh, sort of maybe less effective ways of assessment that I've at least, and maybe it's my echo chamber on Twitter, uh, uh, the rise of ungrading um, and really um, more and more folks who are um, embracing forms of ungrading as a means of sort of pushing back against um, a more sort of skills-based um, uh, assessment, um, or rather not, not sort of embracing, you know, a wider range of, of types of assessment. Yeah, right? <laughs> and I will add comment. that, um, one of the things that uh, technology always seems to do, right, is that it exacerbates, it amplifies, it makes things more efficient, it uh, streamlines things. Um, and so even though I want to say, like, I, I don't want to target any one particular technology or any set of technologies, I've done in-person proctoring before, and I've seen the harms that can come from that, the student anxiety. I've worked the um, accommodations room with people who have a differing set of needs that um, the accommodations don't always uh uh, account for and I've seen just really horrible things happen there and so I, I do know that this technology is just going to amplify those those horrible things that come uh, just with this type of testing. Thank you so much for coming. So I'm just curious in our last two minutes I know I, I think take a sort of step back and think about um, social annotation um, as a broader phenomenon, in particular, to sort of annotate ed tech. And if folks have ideas or ways in which they envision using something like this in your own teaching practice. In, in one minute or less. And if you don't, that's fine too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's that normalization of surveillance that, that Autumn talked about. Oh, I think we excellent. may be out of time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll continue I was, the conversation. <laughs> I was just about to say that was absolutely 
absolutely fascinating and um yeah I, I had lots of things running through my mind there at the end about neoliberalism in education and lots of different lots of different things which i'm currently writing my thesis on so yeah that was great to be part of and, and moderate for you so if we could all um put our virtual hands together and uh give a big round of um applause to charles and to autumn for that because that was absolutely fantastic um so thank you everybody for taking part today i'm just going